us about how the universe is going to end and how everything we do today doesn't matter, right? It's all... Uh, not really. <laughs> so this is the very condensed future of the universe by Evan Bray. Hi everyone, in the last few talks here, you heard a brief overview of some of the main events that have happened in the universe up until this point. So from the year zero up until the year 13.7 billion, which is basically today. And in my talk here, I'm going to tell you about some of the main events that we can expect to happen in the universe from now up until the end of time. Or at least the date so far from now that we don't really care to count it. So for starters, we, uh, the Earth spins, of course, and its rotation axis isn't exactly right, uh, straight up and down. It's tilted a little bit, and this is what gives us our seasons. And this rotation axis rotates around the, uh, spins around the sky. That is, it wobbles a lot, like a, a lot like a top. And it makes one complete rotation every 26,000 years. So what this means for us is that 13,000 years from now, the seasons will have flip-flopped uh, exactly opposite, so that winter, for us here in the northern hemisphere, will start in June. This also means that you can't use the North Star anymore to find North, because it won't be pointing in that direction. Instead, you'll have to use this other decently bright star named Vega. All right. Based on what we know about the Earth's evolutionary history and the solar system in general, the Earth tends to get in the way of a giant asteroid about every, well, once every 100 million years or so. But there is a lot of hand-waving in that number. So this is a good time to mention that in uh, a lot of things in astronomy are based on a lot of hand-waving. And uh, this is very similar to saying that I can't tell you exactly when you, uh, as an individual, will win the lottery. But I'm 99.9% .9 sure that someone will eventually win the lottery. So I can't tell you when the next asteroid is going to come by. but. Eventually, Earth will get in the way of one someday. But hopefully by this point, we'll have figured out a way to deal with it. Because even today, there are people working on ways to deflect an asteroid if we can detect it early on enough in its path. As the sun is burning through its hydrogen core and it ages slowly, it slowly gets brighter and brighter. So that a billion years from now, it will be uh, significantly brighter than it is today, and this has some unfortunate consequences for Earth. One of them is that right uh, on Earth right now, the average surface temperature is 56 degrees Fahrenheit. And so here in State College, we're about average. There are some places that are colder and some places that are warmer. But a billion years from now, when the sun is significantly brighter than it is today, the average surface temperature on Earth will be 116 degrees Fahrenheit. So this makes a vast chunk of Earth's surface basically unlivable. The other consequence of this is that it causes the oceans to enter some runaway evaporation. So we don't have those anymore. Oh, oh okay. So four billion years from now, Earth, uh, so the Milky Way is going to collide with its next closest neighbor, the Andromeda Galaxy, which we'll, she, which we'll see show up here in the bottom left. And Andromeda is about three times the size of the Milky Way. But this is not a particularly troubling event. Actually, it's kind of exciting. Because for any one particular star, for our sun, for example, there's a very, very small chance that it's actually going to physically collide with something else in Andromeda. And the reason for this is that the distances between stars are, is just enormous compared to the size of the star itself. So there's actually, I'd be willing to bet that there's a lot of astrophysicists that would be really excited to have evolved in a period in time in which our home galaxy is in the process of colliding with, a, with its neighbor. When they collide, they'll form what we call an elliptical galaxy, which is a large, fuzzy-looking blob here, as opposed to a disk galaxy, like we have today. A short billion years later, five billion years from now, the sun is going to run out of hydrogen fuel in its core. This means that it'll turn into a red giant, and it'll swell up to a ridiculously enormous size. In the inset in this picture here, there's a yellow circle that represents the size of the sun today and this, uh, the size of the sun once it becomes a red giant. And notice that once the sun becomes a red giant, it actually becomes larger than the size of the Earth's orbit. But the Earth is not going to be engulfed by the sun at this point because by the time this happens, 
the Earth will the Earth will have moved out to a much wider, longer orbit around the Sun. But unfortunately, when the Sun becomes a red giant, it also becomes incredibly bright. So this means that at this point in time, the Earth has returned to being a ocean of lava, which is really similar to what it looked like when it first formed. So it's kind of a full circle in that sense. <coughs> One of the things that the previous speakers told you about is that the universe is changing in size, and exactly how it changes in size depends on what the universe is made of. So in the bottom left here, you can see we have the Big Bang, and there's a black dot in the center that represents where we are now and the current size of the universe. And there's a few different areas that represent where the universe can go from here, again, depending on what it's made of. So for example, if the universe has a lot of matter in it, then eventually this expansion of the universe will slow down and it will begin to contract back in on itself. So that someday, everything in the universe is going to come crashing back together. Again, that's only if the universe has a lot of matter in it. On the flip side, if the universe doesn't have a whole lot of matter in it, then it'll follow this upward trend uh, labeled the Big Rip. What this means is that everything in the universe eventually becomes, uh, the universe is expanding so quickly that nothing in the universe can interact with one another anymore. <coughs> Based on the best experimental evidence we have today from the last few decades, we're quite sure that our universe is going to follow one of these middle arrows where there's neither a big rip or a big crunch and just a continuous, peaceful, relatively peaceful existence of nothingness, I guess. Fast forwarding a long time to about 200 billion years from now, the Milky Way becomes kind of an island in the universe. That is, it's, it becomes relatively uh, becomes alone. And the reason for this is that because the universe is expanding, the distance between individual galaxies becomes really big. And this makes travel between galaxies increasingly hard. By the time this, by the time uh, 200 billion years from now, even if you could travel at very close to the speed of light, traveling to other galaxies becomes impossible because these other uh, our neighboring galaxies are moving away from us faster than you're traveling, so you'll simply never get there. And this has some interesting consequences for any intelligent civilizations that might arise in, in any galaxy at this point in time. Because they, if they choose to build telescopes, they'll look out in the night sky and they'll see stars and all the a lot of the neat things we see in astronomy today. But if they try to look further than their own galaxy, they won't see anything. They won't be able to see the cosmic microwave background. And they won't be able to they won't be able to make any determinations about where the universe came from. They won't be able to know anything about the Big Bang. Because they can't see any other galaxies, they won't be able to make any de determinations about where the universe is going in the future. So to them, they'll think that the universe is just them. It's just their galaxy. And they won't know that like we do today that there's hundreds of billions of galaxies out in the universe. very long time after that, 10 trillion years from now, the very last star in the universe will be born. And a few billion years after this, the very last star will fizzle out. A lot like here on, uh, so stars, uh, the principle behind star formation is that stars are made from the remnants of older stars. And this recycling process can go on for a long time, but just like here on Earth, it can't go on forever. Eventually, you get all the available energy out of something that you can, and the process has to come to an end. But this is, this is an incredibly long time now, and I want to illustrate just how far away it is. So in this image here, this red rectangle that you see in the top left, let's make that represent the amount of time that has passed from the Big Bang up until today. So it's 13.7 billion, uh, billion years across, all right? This is the amount of time that's left until the end of star formation. So up in the top left in that red rectangle contains everything that has ever happened. So there's still plenty of time left until the last star fizzles out. The final notable event that the universe is going to go through is something commonly referred to as heat death of the universe. And what this means is that the universe will have cooled down to be very close to absolute zero. This means that things have come to a stop and all of the matter in the universe has decayed into its most fundamental particles and the last black hole has evaporated. This means that there are no more chemical reactions, 
Nothing is moving anymore. Nothing ever changes again. Forever. <laughs> now, I know you're probably feeling some pretty weird things right now. That's all right. <laughs> I am too. That's totally natural. But the good news here is that this is all an incredibly long time away. The most important time is now. Because now is the time when people like you and I can make a difference to make the next decade or the next century better than the last one. And I think it's very fortunate that we haven't have evolved in the time period that we have for three reasons. The first is that we have the scientific ability and the tools to investigate where the universe has come from. And we have a sufficient physical understanding of the universe to make some determinations about where it's going next. And lastly, we have an unimaginably long period of time to explore it all. And I think that's something worth being excited about. Thanks for listening, everyone. If there's, any, if there's any questions or existential, if there's any questions or existential crises, I'm happy to help out. <laughs> yeah. So, why is it called the heat death? If everything is ridiculously cold. So you could think of it in terms of. Oh, sorry. So uh, the question was, why is it called the heat death if everything is just uh, very cold at that point? And uh, maybe a, a good way of thinking of the heat death of the universe is that at this point in time, all the you know, heat is energy, all right? And during the heat death of the universe, all the available energy of the universe has been used up, which is why nothing else can happen after that point. <laughs> so it, it takes a very, very, takes a, uh, the question is, how does a black hole evaporate? What does that mean? Because uh, things can only enter a black hole, they can never leave. So how can a black hole possibly get smaller? And this is, some, this is one of the things that Stephen Hawking was really famous for. Black holes evaporate via something called Hawking radiation, which uh, you, takes quite a bit of quantum mechanics understanding to you know, work out. But it's something that uh, helps Stephen Hawking get famous in the first place. <laughs> yes? So, you said 200 million years from now, all the galaxies will be super far away. Yes? So, would that be the Milky Way being alone? Would that be Milky Way in the elliptical galaxy with Andromeda, or that would be Milky Way separate? Uh, yeah, that's right. Because by the time, uh, the question was, uh, sorry, the question was, when the galaxies have all become so far separated that we can't travel between them anymore, Will that be just the Milky Way, or will that be the new Milky Way Andromeda combo? So by that time, you know, by 200 billion years from now, the Milky Way and Andromeda will have uh, completely combined, and they'll become, they will have become the new elliptical galaxy, whatever that may be called. So the only thing left in our, uh, there are a few other small galaxies surrounding the Milky Way and Andromeda, and those will have merged with this new elliptical super galaxy as well by that time, so we will be a local group composed of a single galaxy. Yeah. So you said that uh, in 13,000 years, sorry, yeah, 13,000 years, the most recent, so 13,000 years ago, were the future, how, what would you say? So the question was, uh, from the very first slide, where I mentioned that 13,000 years from now, the seasons will be completely flipped in terms of what time they start in the year. So this, uh, you're correct, this does mean that 13,000 years ago, winter did start in June for the Northern Hemisphere. Great, that's archeologists, that's very concerning. <laughs> so, you can, so, you can, so you can do the math and see just, uh, you know, over the course of the average human's lifetime, how many minutes later in the year winter will start on average. So over these big time scales, yeah, it, it, uh, winter does start completely opposite. Yes, but th that's a very good point as well. That in 13,000 years, the calendar system that you can that you use changes a lot as well. Question here. Um, so you said the Milky Way and Andromeda galaxy are going to combine in what four billion years? Do you do you know? Do we know if um, that elliptical galaxy is going to combine with any other? nearby galaxies, or is that going to be like the last point? Right. So the question was, what other galaxies are going to combine into this Milky Way Andromeda super galaxy? If not what? 
Yeah, okay, yes. So, the, uh, sorry, the answer is that there is at least one other decent sized galaxy that will combine. There are, I think, three, you know, there's like, this only a small number of decent sized galaxies in the local group. And the other big one is called the Triangulum Galaxy. But it's going to collide with the Milky Way Andromeda combo after the Milky Way and Andromeda, Milky Way and Andromeda have already combined. How many years that will happen, though, I, from now I'm not exactly sure. So it's just a local group then? Yes. Okay. Just the very local galaxies that will combine into the so in the big rift scenario that you were talking about, is that just all the galaxies get further apart, or is that it said like it looks like it was accelerating? Is that everything gets ripped apart? So the question is what exactly uh, what exactly defines uh, the big rift? Is it just so this depends on what exactly dark energy is, but the I uh, based on my based on my novice understanding of the big rift is that. Uh, the Big Rip is defined as the time after which uh, the expansion of the universe, the rate that the universe is expanding, reaches infinity. And um, for certain, depending on uh, the certain parameters of what dark energy is that we don't know yet, there may be a Big Rip or there may not be, but we're still working on that. <laughs> Sure to tip her weight stuff, and I will see you all on June 5th.